Welcome. I'm Charles Elson, the director of the John L. Weinberg Center for Corporate Governance at the University of Delaware. The Weinberg Center is pleased to present a discussion on the impact of the Federal Reserve Board sanctions on the financial services industry and what boards at all financial services companies and all public companies need to know. Recently, the Fed announced a uh, sanction uh, on a major American bank, uh, ordering it effectively to uh, remain at its current asset size in response to governance concerns that the Fed had at that institution. And that has sparked a lot of discussion on the Fed's role in corporate governance of those institutions and how the institution should appropriately respond. And more importantly, the boards of those institutions should appropriately respond. Today, we're honored to have three guests to join us for this discussion. I'd like to briefly introduce each of them. Please note their complete bios are available on our website, uh, which you can access quite easily, we hope. David Wright is Managing Director, Governance, Regulatory, and Risk Strategies at Deloitte & Touche, LLP. In this role, he advises financial institutions on regulatory matters with a particular focus on the implementation of Dodd-Frank Enhanced uh, prudential standards, as well as supervisory expectations for risk management. Prior to joining Deloitte, he has served in numerous roles with the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco over the span of 23 years. Prior to joining the Fed, he was Vice President at uh, First Boston. Kim Haynes is an independent senior advisor to Deloitte. Kim most recently had a dual role at Bank of America as both a global technology and operations business controls executive and the enterprise non-financial regulatory reporting executive. In these roles, Kim was responsible for defining and deploying common risk management processes, tools, metrics, and learning uh, curriculums, risk governance and reporting, and establishing enterprise-wide oversight of all non-financial regulatory reporting obligations. Kim helped redefine Bank of America's global compliance function as a second line defense to ensure compliance across all lines of the business. And finally, Myron Steele is a partner at Potter, Anderson, and Caroon, and is the former Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court and Chairman of the Weinberg Center Advisory Board. Previously, he served as a judge of the Superior Court and a Vice Chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery after 18 years in private litigation practice. He's presided over major corporate litigation, an LLC, and limited partner governance disputes, and writes frequently and speaks frequently on issues of corporate document interpretation and corporate governance. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Charles Elson, director of the Weinberg Center, and the Edgar S. Wheeler Jr. Chair in Corporate Governance and Professor of Finance here at the University of Delaware. The panel today is going to first focus on the evolving regulatory landscape in the financial services industry, during which we'll be getting insights from David and from Kim. The second part of our discussion will focus on expectations for and the lessons learned from this evolving federal regulatory landscape for all public company boards. We're fortunate today to have with us former Delaware Chief Justice Steele, who will be joining that part of the discussion. The third part of the discussion will be focused on the Delaware courts, where they are with respect to some of these issues. Now, let's begin. First, talking about evolving regulatory landscape for financial services boards. Kim, let's start with you. With regard to this regulatory landscape, why is the Fed only just recently focused on board of director expectations? I think the first thing I'd say, it's not a new focus. I think most uh, boards and management teams and financial services uh, companies um, since the financial crisis have been hearing very consistent feedback from the Federal Reserve in terms of expectations of board effectiveness, of management, of independent risk functions. And I think the guidance that they've issued uh, now for out for comment uh, around board effectiveness and risk management really codifies those expectations with some consistency and a lot more uh, specificity of what success looks like in terms of all those roles being effective. David, do recent enforcement actions mean that the Fed has raised the bar on what's expected of corporate boards? Um, I don't think so much. I'd echo Kim's comments that this really reflects expectations that are long standing by the Fed. So it's really a question of focus and perhaps a little bit of impatience. So if we rewind back to just after the financial crisis, 
the Fed's agenda was around capital, liquidity, resolution planning, and governance and controls. The first three aspects really consume the vast majority of the time, shoring up capital uh, positions of the major banks, their liquidity positions, and also making sure that they were more resilient and resolvable. And the fourth piece is a grayer area, more difficult to put bright lines around, but certainly always a focus of examiners and the back and forth. So you can see on the journey since the financial crisis, there have been a number of mishaps, whether you're talking about LIBOR, FX, uh, add-on products for credit cards, mm -hmm. some of the mortgage foreclosure practices. A lot of these things banks had said right after the crisis, we get it, we're better controlled now, and we're gonna make sure there aren't any of these types of mishaps. And yet they've happened again and again and again. And the board has asked the question, are these firms too big to manage? Where was the board of directors in providing proper oversight? So I think now that we're 10 years almost past the financial crisis, um, the patience is wearing thin and some of the remedial actions that banks have been trying to execute you know, have either come to fruition or not, and the Fed is making current judgments about which boards are effective and which aren't, and they're getting that feedback. The board effectiveness guidance really lays more clearly what are the fundamentals that boards should pay attention to in their day-to-day -day oversight role. The Fed recently proposed a new rating system for the largest banks that includes a governance and controls component. To support the governance and controls rating, they also issued proposed guidance on board effectiveness. Kim, can you provide a brief summary description of the new rating system uh, and the governance and controls components? Uh, sure. Uh, in some ways, it's a simplification of the rating system that was used before that had more components, um, but I think now it's personally that it's simpler because it's broken down between capital and liquidity which guidance has been really clear about with the number of CCAR uh, examinations and stress testing and recovery and resolution plan reviews etc. Um, but the uh, governance and uh, control portion uh, that's been added again kind of goes back to the comments I made on the guidance that's been out for review now. It's really clarifying those expectations of what governance looks like and what the role of a board is versus the role of senior management and really separating those very clearly um, and defining what that effectiveness looks like for a board um, versus senior management and other roles in the company. Um, one of the other things that is uniquely different in the rating system is uh, the supervisor in charge, uh, for example, could look at the ratings and in individual components in the past and make a composite or an aggregate rating of whether the institution is considered well managed. And the new rating system rates uh, capital and liquidity and governance and control independently and with the theory that your safety and soundness of the institution is as strong as its weakest link. So if one of those three isn't satisfactory, um, then you, in some ways you can't say the institution's well managed. And I think that's a big difference in uh, not having the uh, leeway of doing a composite that could uh, maybe smooth over something. David, what are the most important elements for the boards to get right in that guidance? And assuming the proposed board effectiveness guidelines and guidance is finalized, what should boards do to make sure they meet those Fed expectations? Well, the proposed guidance, it really has five key elements. So I'd say you really have to hit on all five. But in order of how I think about the importance the first one would be the board's role in setting business strategy and risk tolerance. If the board gets that wrong, the rest really doesn't matter. The second piece is accountability, holding management accountable. And what we're talking about there is really having a uh, game plan around how you will hold management accountable um, and rules for the road that are communicated in advance to management so everyone's clear on what that rule set is. So we know 
in terms of you know management uh, mishaps. It can be anything from just missing earnings. It could be maybe not providing adequate supervision for direct reports, all the way to out uh, outright malfeasance. So you know the the punishment needs to fit the crime. The board needs to think about how they're going to uh, address those various elements of performance uh, and hold management accountable. Um, the third piece would be being active consumers of uh, management information. So in the past, many boards have just taken giant decks and not opined on whether those were fit for purpose, whether they were too lengthy or too short. And now boards should really be focused on actively consuming this information and critiquing uh, the quality of that information. For example, if something's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for a peer institution, they should be looking to management to adjusting the MIS they uh, give them. They should actually be actively seeking out engagement with management on issues of the day saying, could we have a special briefing around this topic? Um, the fourth piece, very important, promoting the stature and independence of independent risk management and audit. Um, making sure that those executives in those key positions, the CRO and the chief audit executive, are of the same caliber in the C-suite as the rest of uh, the business management. And then finally, having a composition of a board that really is commensurate with the risk and complexity of the institution. So as vacancies come up, uh, boards should really be thinking about having uh, a skills analysis around the existing board members, what the gaps are, and should actually have a, an, an active recruiting strategy around who do they want to fill those critical positions to round out the board's ability to understand the issues of the day and effectively challenge management? So those five are the key in the guidance. I think a lot of people agree these are the fundamental pieces that boards should pay attention to. And the big benefit of this proposed guidance is that it really distinguishes that role from day-to-day -day management responsibilities, which were often conflated in past guidance that the Fed had issued. Now, the Fed has issued a risk management proposal earlier this year. David, can you briefly describe the proposal as it relates to what we're talking about today? Sure. So uh, if we think about the description I just gave of the board's activities, what the Fed wanted to do in this governance and controls is provide guidance as to what the expectations are for the rest of the institution, senior management oversight and the three lines of defense. So it starts with describing senior management's responsibilities for day-to-day -day oversight of business lines and the independent risk management groups. It talks about them supplying enough resources for uh, firms or the individuals in the uh, first and second lines to do their jobs, to have adequate policies and procedures supporting them, to be making sure that the risk appetite uh, set by the board is being followed in the day-to-day -day conduct. Um, business line management is also called out in terms of their responsibilities to identify risk, have adequate controls to control those risks. Um, and also uh, a responsibility to escalate and stay within the uh, risk limits and parameters that have been set for them. For independent risk management, it talks about uh, the checks and balances of the first line. It discusses the role of aggregating enterprise risk across business lines and understanding the full firm risk and setting enterprise risk limits uh, given those risks. So uh, a, a lot there in terms of the, uh, all the three lines of defense. One reason driving this uh, push for clarity is during the financial crisis, one of the root causes identified by the Fed 
was a diffusion of responsibility. The businesses saying risk was responsible for controlling that risk and risk saying that was the business line's job, for example, and then everyone else pointing to the board. So by clarifying the three lines of defense, how the checks and balances are expected to work, um, this makes sure that this uh, virtu uh, this uh, work towards accountability uh, can be accomplished because you really need clarity of roles if you're going to hold people accountable for the jobs they're expected to do. Kim, with respect to the risk management proposal, what shifts uh, do you expect between boards, senior management, uh, business line management, and independent risk functions and audit? e.g. more direct reporting to boards, committees for risk, et cetera. I think the uh, first shift, David hit on it a little bit, in the board needing one to prove, which is the other piece that's in the guidance, is the requirement for documentation and sort of being from Missouri that if you can't show me it didn't happen, um, and the board being able to set up it, uh, itself to really set that business strategy, which you have to do with senior management collaboratively, but then to show that the, the board's got somewhere on that 51% vote, so to speak, in terms of the strategy and the risk tolerance, um, that's a bit of a shift to David's point. Oftentimes the, those two operate more collaboratively, and it's not that I don't think they'll become uncollaborative. I just think needing to um, have those some lines of separation of duties um, will be a, a shift for some organizations. I would expect from a senior management perspective, um, depending on how they interact with their board today, if board members are expected to be a lot more engaged and a lot uh, more curious or scrutinizing, if you will, um, that could change the tone in some of the conversations. Uh, I think it'll certainly change the expectation for management uh, to be transparent on what's going on. Um, I, the board needing to show that they control their own agenda and that there's robust discussion and that there's challenge. Um, I, I think sometimes you can see to David, he made the point, boards often get a thousand pages that they're supposed to review. And one of the challenges, I think, for a board will be to be very clear on what information they want and how they want to consume it. Um, they should feel empowered to say that I'd like it in Kitchen English um, because regardless of how complicated something is, you should be able to explain it to where um, y your board members would understand it. Um, there'll probably be a shift of uh, probably being more exception management based in the information that they're reviewing so they're getting to the um, maybe not so pleasant stuff first. Um, I think board members will spend a lot more time outside of board meetings um, because it's how they'll probably need to engage with senior management and the chief risk officers and their chief compliance officers and audit teammates um, and even other senior managers maybe two or three deep to get uh, a better understanding on particular issues, um, get educated on complex issues like cybersecurity. Uh, I just think it's asking them to go a whole lot deeper, which is going to make the role of the independent risk function and um, senior management to be a lot more engaged. The volume of information they receive can sometimes be daunting. The more the volume, the less likely someone's going to focus on it. Yeah. David and Kim, how has the boardroom discussion been impacted by the Fed's comprehensive capital analysis and review? cybersecurity, risk management, and expectations for, quote, effective challenge. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> well, I'd say what's happened is the Fed, after the financial crisis, uh, had sat through a lot of presentations with management um, and was doing supervision by PowerPoint, so they just get a nice storyline. And now they're more about show me, not tell me. And show me is show me in the minutes where the board was presented this strategy, this information, and then show me how management or how the board has effectively challenged management. So that's created uh, a huge industry of documentation at actually every level, not just the board, down at the senior management, top to bottom, showing in, in writing 
how the checks and balances actually function with the institution. And this has created a huge amount of uh, burden on corporate secretary functions, and they've had to expand quite a bit. Um, and uh, we actually uh, help at Deloitte uh, board secretaries around um, their role and ideas about how to manage some of this uh, inflow and outflow of information and, and documentation. And of course, there's this really tough tension between, um, you know, being transparent about how decisions were made and not getting so bogged down uh, that you can't get things done. And so it's really slowed down, I think, uh, a lot of the governance processes at banks. and. At the same time, I think the Fed at least has now a window into how these checks and balances work. Mm -hmm. How intense the scrutiny will continue to be remains to be seen. I'd say right now it is an absolute peak in terms of scrutiny, documentation, and hard labor on this. I don't know, Kim, if you've got thoughts on that. I mean, I completely agree with that. I, I think the other um, thing that I've touched on before, and I'll just say it again, it's the discussions not just in the boardroom, it's discussions outside the boardroom because board meetings are only so long and, and frankly there's a lot of information mandated to go to a board, um, so it's a catch-22. Um, and, and then you couple that with really complicated um, risk or challenges that a company may be going through a board member can't consume that in a 15-minute period and so I, I think you see a lot more meetings outside of the meeting um, just for sheer education and uh, additional oversight so that the meetings themselves can be more robust and, and more productive because uh, there's just so much to cover. Myron, not going to let you off the hook. Uh, as a lawyer and board advisor, with regard to public companies generally, what have been the board discussions on these particular topics and have you seen much of an impact? Well, I'm glad you phrased your question in terms of public companies generally, because I can't demonstrate the intense insight that Kim and David have just shown us into the financial services industry. My experience is more generalized. The first point I would make is hearing about the responsibility that directors have for oversight, whether you characterize it as risk management or regulatory compliance, they're all keenly aware of the responsibility that they have. There are opportunities to be informed or multiple through the NACD and other organizations and frequent programs available for their accreditation as directors. So it's not as if they're not conscious of their responsibility. They're also very focused on their reputations. They fear reputational damage more than they fear liability as a result of the actions of plaintiff's counsel because they want to do the right thing for the right reason. And they have assumed that position with the understanding that their focus is on the best interest of the institution they serve and the share shareholder or stockholder investors. But the major tension is the consumption of time. Their role is to set strategy and monitor management with growth and expectations of growth and shareholder value all in mind. When they're distracted, so to speak, by a heavy regulatory compliance burden or a dictated prescriptive system that tells them what they're supposed to do under various circumstances, it restricts the amount of time they have available to do what they, I have to say, pretty much uniformly think is their primary responsibility which is to grow the institution and the stockholders investment. So I th that's where the major discussion is focused. How do we find the time to do this job well? It's not a discussion about we shouldn't have this responsibility. There's no reason for us to have this responsibility. Oversight's a nuisance. It's nothing like that. They recognize they have that dual function and how they allocate their time and how they access information necessary to ca carry out both those roles is their primary concern. And that's basically where the focus has been. And there, there is a conscious effort when you use the term impact. The impact I see is their response 
to try to do it all and do it all well. I think most boards have the sense of educational experience diversity that helps them cope with most of the issues, but it never takes away from them their focus on the ball as they see it, which is to improve the health of the organization and its investors. Let's start our discussion to board expectations. The center here has been <coughs> focusing recently on the board's role with respect to corporate culture. We've uh, held roundtables with regard to compliance breakdowns at large companies, and we've published articles related to those lessons learned. The center has also produced a video focused on the general counsel's role as an ally to the board with regard to corporate culture. Uh, these center efforts have focused on the reporting relationship of the general counsel, ensuring that the right information is getting to the board and the necessary follow-up is being done. Another point is that in a decentralized organization, it's not only important for the general counsel to have a seat at the table with the board, but also that the lawyers in decentralized units have a reporting obligation to that general counsel so that information as well as follow-up gets to the board itself. It's also important to note that the board has a number of allies in the senior management team in addition to the general counsel, including the internal auditor, the risk officer, and the chief compliance officer. Now that being said, David, uh, Kim, and Myron, what advice would you give a board member in terms of making sure they're getting the quality, timely, and credible information from the following uh, to enable the board to effectively conduct its oversight responsibilities? I'm talking about senior management, the legal department, the <coughs> compliance department, and the risk managers. Myron, uh, Kim, and David, what kind of expectation should boards place on general counsels, compliance departments, and risk managers to ensure that the right information is gathered and the proper follow-up and tracking is being conducted when there are, in fact, compliance breakdowns? I'll, I'll start. I don't want this to sir, sound like a liturgical mantra, but they should be focused on their duty of care. And their duty of care in essentially is to assure that they get all the material information that they need in order to exercise a reasoned judgment. That sounds, again, like a religious liturgy, but it has so much meaning, particularly with respect to case law, that with hindsight takes a look at how directors acted properly and improperly. I don't think we should have a hammer over their heads in that respect, but they should be consistently reminded of both their duty of loyalty and their duty of care. And that places the responsibility on them not to just take what's given to them, but to take what is given to them and ask questions about that information and demand more where a reasoned judgment would require more information. You cannot, in today's world, be a passive director. You have to be affirmative, not necessarily aggressive, but affirmative in getting the information necessary to make you comfortable that you've satisfied your duty of care and have all the material information that's reasonably available placed in front of you. Now, the second arm of that, of course, is, though it's not, not in direct response to your question, is once you have that information, you have to look at it, think about it in a thoughtful way, and follow up with questions and ask for more information when it's necessary. David? Um, I think one way to gauge whether you're getting enough information is, are you surprised? Are there sudden things that pop up out of nowhere? And if there are, then I think it's time for the board to ask for a health check around the fundamentals of a, a, a really strong <coughs> compliance and risk framework detection, prevention, remediation, and governance, including how it's escalated at various levels, and then finally to the board. So if there are not adequate checks and balances uh, around all of these issues, then you will find that last stage, the last piece of oversight, the board, is not going to get what it needs. Um, so if, if you're getting surprised, time for a health check. Um, and it's not easy to get perfect, and there will always be something that falls between the cracks, but I think uh, recent history shows very well how 
Um, there were early indications that uh, the fundamentals of strong compliance were not actually, you know, effective. Yeah. Kim? I, I will echo what, um, what David just said as well, because big problems don't come up overnight. And it didn't, you know, the sun didn't rise and suddenly something is massively wrong that wasn't coming along over a period of time. Uh, Except a hurricane. Well, yeah, <laughs> not quite, quite the same. Um, but uh, the information that comes to the board, the board has every right, like I said before, to demand that it come to them in time to consume, to your point, Myron, because it's a lot to consume, um, but also in a way that's understandable. And to focus on where the strategy is being achieved, where the risk tolerances are, and, and where the company's performing within those tolerances. But to talk about the risk and issues early in the conversation, you have a limited amount of time. And often uh, you'll see of the thousand page documents, risk and issues and progress on some of the more complicated challenges that the management team's working through can be on page 189 and um, maybe weren't left but five minutes of discussion. And so you, I think a board member has to demand that they're getting to the heart of those things first, um, cutting fluff out of the conversation as well. And I'll still go back to the point I made before, those outside meeting conversations and relationships with um, the independent risk leaders like a chief compliance officer, chief risk officer, your legal counsel, your general auditor, um, to hear what's on their mind that might not have made it into the boardroom yet. Kim, following up on that, what advice would you give a board member in terms of knowing what information is needed, how often it's needed, and basically what questions to, they should be asking? One of the biggest piece of advice I would be if you're getting something that you don't understand, I would just go back and say, I don't understand it, and you need to put it in terms that uh, break it down, either spend time with me offline and walk me through it, but it can't be so complicated that I can't consume it so that I do know what questions to ask. Um, stay in abreast of what's going on in the industry outside of the board uh, meeting. Uh, I think David made the point earlier, if something's happening in a peer institution, uh, don't wait for the management team to come and tell you whether the uh, company has the same problem, go ask. Um, and then I think secondly would be just mining the details on where risk and issues are and where they're getting resolved um, and asking if you're not being kept abreast of if you heard something the last time or the quarter before and you're not getting progress on where it is. Um, don't assume that that's because everything's fine. It's okay to ask and make sure that transparency is coming to you. David Martin, this is the tough question. How can board members drive accountability for a strong ethics and compliance culture? What's their role in the thing? How, how can they do it? Well, it gets down to, I think, what I mentioned before under accountability is sort of setting the rules for the road, um, sort of tying um, behavior versus consequences, making sure that people understand the penalty function in advance so that there isn't a hesitation to execute on accountability. The other thing is to make it very public as you get into the more severe types of accountability. So I reflect back on uh, a CEO that told uh, the Federal Reserve that um, in the past when there would be a major transgression, an employee may be involved in fraud, malfeasance. They would fire this person, but quietly usher them out of the institution and not talk about it. Today, they've completely turned that around. And the way they do that is by actually taking the person out in the middle of the day and walking them through the institution with a box in hand showing that they are being ejected from the institution. And then an email is sent to every part of the globe saying, this person did the following things, and as a consequence, this person has been ejected. And by the way, these senior management that had oversight for this person didn't follow through on their oversight capabilities, and here's the penalty function for them. So that transparency sends a big 
cultural message to the rest of the institution. When accountability is done privately, it satisfies a short-term immediate need, but it doesn't communicate what are the true values of the firm. Well, that's a lesson, frankly, that applies both to public companies and to nonprofit institutions. Same, same story. It's Connor? interesting to me, Charles, that you, in the same sentence, address strong ethics and compliance culture. To me, that they pose distinct issues. On the first, the strong ethics, I remember Enron, which I will quickly point out was an Oregon, not a Delaware corporation, <laughs> had as strong an ethics statement as anyone could have at the time posted in the boardroom. So it's more than just fronting to the employees that we have these standards. This is the basis by which you will all be judged with respect to the ethics of the operations of this organization. You have to continue to educate and you have to show by example that members of the board of directors and the officers of the corporation are as dedicated to that ethical framework and environment as they expect the employees to be. Because you can't demand accountability for others if you're not accountable yourself. Compliance is a little bit different in my mind because that's something imposed by somebody else. And learning from the Caremark case years ago from Chancellor Allen, that's about institutionalizing a system that will, in a focused way, give you a process to track what is being done in the compliance arena. You have the methodology set out, but then there's the second role that the board has to pay, play, and that is to monitor whether or not that process is adequately being pursued by the employees and take the kind of action that David has pointed out to us when there's a discovery of a failure. You, no longer can anyone sweep anything under the rug to be trite. It has to be out there and open to assure everyone that there not only is accountability, but there's dedication at the top to both the strong ethical culture of the institution and the requirement that compliance have a process that's regularly monitored. Byron, it, 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 we've been talking quite a bit about Fed expectations, but we are in Delaware, and Delaware happens to regulate most of the public companies in this country, uh, and certainly the law of Delaware has huge impact on public companies all over the country. <clears throat> Where are the Delaware courts with respect to board expectations and the topics that we've been talking about today? Where does Delaware stand on this? Because, that, frankly, it is as important as the Fed, as these are, in fact, Delaware corporations. Right. I'm, I'm happy to answer that because you're now in an area where I'm a lot more comfortable than I was talking about <laughs> compliance with Fed dictates. <laughs> you, were, you were but a state employee. Yeah, well, as, as, as any good lawyer, I'm 100% in favor of progress and 1,000% against change. So the <laughs> framework for analysis is the same today that it's been since 1910 when Delaware first became prominent in this area. And that is common law fiduciary duties. I mentioned the duty of loyalty and the duty of care, but it's hindsight review. It's not prescriptive. The courts issue opinions which serve as guidelines to boards which illustrate for them in distinct context how one comports with the duty of loyalty and the duty of care, or worse, how one did not comport so you can model your activity after that. So I don't think the basic analytical framework has changed at all. It's driven largely by litigation, something which I've become far more fond of in the last four years than in the 25 years before that. But it, it's illustrative. It's informative. It's a method of training in a real world context. It, it's the worry that I personally have and the few people that still agree with me now that I've left the court. I've noticed how many people used to agree with me as opposed to those who don't today. I don't think prescriptive regulatory is, is a method that produces the best result. But hindsight review within a context in the real world with findings of what the facts were, what are the consequences of those facts, and who's responsible for them is not only the best way to educate, but it's the fairest way to demand accountability where accountability is necessary. The major trend that I've seen with the 
court's view of their hindsight review is more and more reliance on the fact that institutional investors dominate the stockholder scene today. There's, I think, a clear view on the part of the Delaware courts that they bring expertise, even though it's highly self-interested, that they're not a monolith in their interest, and they're certainly not aligned necessarily with retail stockholders. But they have expertise, experience, and the ability to hire good advisors. So they need to be paid attention to by boards. Their input should be sought. It should be welcomed. It shouldn't be viewed as antagonistic even if it's not a monolithic approach to the issues and even if the board ultimately decides it's not correct. But the courts are showing more reliance on a stockholder vote when the stockholders are well informed than we used to be in circumstances when the stockholder base was 50-50 retail or even in when I first started in the early 70s, maybe a little balance toward retail stockholders. But you will see the courts stepping back a bit if they can see that the process has been designed in such a way that the stockholders, who they think are the people with true skin in the game, have had a fair opportunity to have the issue presented to them with all the material information they need that a reasonable person would want to have before they cast their vote. The courts will step back and there'll be business judgment deference where in the past perhaps not. Except in situations when you're dealing with a controlling stockholder, there's very close scrutiny of the extent to which the board is being driven by a lack of independence. Independence of directors is still hugely important to judicial oversight. And it's not the independence anymore that the focus of the original duty of loyalty cases back in the 30s, that is a financial interest by the directors that's apart from the other stockholders. It's whether or not the directors are independent of another entity or another person, independent in the sense that they don't have a special financial interest, but they can act objectively. There's no reasonable doubt about their ability to act as a director, take action or omit action with the best interest of the institution at heart. So that, I think, is the current framework for analysis. But it's still happily, in my view, highly flexible, not prescriptive like federal regulatory compliance demands, but more, we're watching you. Here's what you need to be watching for. Here are our expectations of how you will act in various process scenarios with the emphasis always on the process and the ability of the directors to be objective and their compliance with their duty of care. Ryan, can you talk specifically about directors' oversight rules uh, and duties generally? Yeah, well, the Caremark cases that I mentioned earlier, it, it, it's very clear that the framework was set in 1994 by Chancellor Allen, and it was that when there is a compliance responsibility, directors clearly, consistently with their duty of loyalty and their duty of care. It's one of those interesting mixes. The duty of loyalty demands you put the methodology or the process in place to assure compliance. The duty of care then demands that you monitor that process. It's not enough to say we've institutionalized this compliance review. We've got people here that are working on that. So we, we can be content. We can go read the Sunday Times now over a weekend instead of keeping ourselves up to date on how our compliance process is actually operating. The old, are there red flags you'll see in cases, a reference to the development of red What do you do if you see a red flag? Do you approach it correctly or not to satisfy your fiduciary duty? So that, it, it's still that very basic, uncomplicated framework. Ryan, well, we've been talking about follow-up remediation when there are serious compliance breakdowns, recognizing that we could do an entire video on effective and compliance investigations. Can you give the audience some guidance with regard to some of the most important points that should be considered with regard to special investigations? Well, special investigations uh, are usually made up of a committee that consists of nothing but independent directors. You certainly can't have management involved in a special committee that's doing the investigation to find out, A, what went wrong, why it went wrong, now what do we do about it? So that's the first test. Make sure that anyone that's on a committee, because a committee is required, because the majority of the board or a substantial number of the members of the board are conflicted, 
then that investigation should be extraordinarily thorough, minuted, and have a written product as a result that details what's been done to demonstrate what went wrong and what will be done to correct it and assure it doesn't happen again. Myron, finally, where do you think the Delaware courts are headed with regards to the topics we've been talking about today? Where is Delaware going with this issue? You've got a Fed approach. What's going to be the Delaware approach? Delaware's not going to change its common law hindsight oversight approach at all. Uh, you're, you're going to see instructive issues based on the context of a case, perhaps nuanced, perhaps defined in a different way. We, we saw developments in the scrutiny of the role of the investment banker in the M&A process and attendant liability under certain circumstances where there is a belief that the investment bankers or the financial advisors, if you prefer, have led the either the independent committee or the board astray in constructing the process in a way that conflicted with the interest of the institution and the stockholders. And interestingly for many of us, a closer review of the lawyer's role in, with the, in the same respect. We have the interesting dichotomy, some people think, of what we refer to generically as 102B7, which is the exculpation of directors, if agreed to by stockholders in the charter, from liability for breach of the duty of care, but no exculpation for a breach of duty of loyalty or the breach of, of or an act in bad faith, I'll put it that way. Before we uh, close, I'd like to ask each of you all to provide a few brief comments, takeaways for those watching uh, this webcast. Uh, David, let's start with you. Um, so I guess I would say the for boards, if you really want to get down to um, being focused on one's role, I would go back to the sort of five fundamentals, and that would be making sure that you've set the strategic direction of the firm and appetite for risk. Number two, that you've come up with a framework for accountability, particularly for senior management. Three, that you are paying attention to the MIS that you're getting from management and becoming an active rather than passive consumer. Um, four, making sure that you're promoting the stature and independence of that independent risk management and uh, chief audit uh, executive. And then finally, that you're um, making sure that you think about succession planning for the board and its composition uh, to ensure that the skills, background, are really compatible with the risk profile and complexity of your institution. Kim. What I would add to, um, to that is the guidance isn't new from a board effectiveness perspective, the proposed guidance, um, in terms of what's been messaged. Um, I wouldn't wait for it to be formalized. Um, and probably to be a skeptic and step back and do a self-assessment. I mean, if your board looks a certain way, whether it's the composition, your effectiveness and your engagement, how robust your discussions are, whatever, if you just dissect every bit of the guidance and step back and skeptically look at it and say, how are we doing? Um, and then where do we think we really need to improve, whether it's the composition of the board or being more articulate about the types of reports you want to get or the way you want meetings structured. Um, I'd probably play offense um, with that uh, more aggressively than wait uh, for someone to give you feedback that you maybe weren't as effective as you thought. All right. Uh, Kim and David have already done a, an excellent job of outlining the framework for thought. I would just add this gloss. Never hesitate to be engaged assure that the record demonstrates that you were in fact engaged. Recognize that all board members understand the tension I mentioned earlier, how much time do you really have to vote to X, Y, or Z, and your prime focus is on the financial health of the institution and its progress on behalf of the stockholder investor. But don't be shy about that. You wouldn't be there unless you were capable of doing the job in almost every instance there. 
are exceptions. If there weren't exceptions, I wouldn't have any work to do. So whether there are exceptions, I can live with that. But don't be concerned about that. Do the right thing for the right reason, as you want to do and as you're capable of doing. And pay attention to the process for your decision making. Well, exercising moderator's privilege uh, to sort of bring it all together. Uh, what we've talked about today has been fascinating and I think awfully informative and important for directors. But I think ultimately the point is, if you think about it, is why are you on a board? And you're there quite simply to create long-term value for the shareholders. And you're there, you do it by effectively monitoring management. How do you do that? A, you've got to be independent of management. B, you've got to have expertise in the area you're looking into. You've got to understand what you're overseeing. C, you've got to have some ownership interest in the company. You've got to have equity in the company itself. A stake gives you the incentive to exercise the objectivity that the independence creates. And then you've got to have some assiduity. You've got to poke around. You've got to be, you, you've got to be tough and look. And finally, and I think most importantly, you've got to have courage. Courage that if you find something that concerns you, to bring it up as an issue and, and, and run it down as long as it takes to get it resolved correctly. And I think with that, ultimately, you're doing your service. And whether it's the Delaware Courts or the Federal Reserve Board, they're all getting to the same point. And I think it's important for directors to think about this as they carry out their awfully important responsibilities. Now, I'd like to thank uh, Kim, David, and Myron for joining us today. Uh, and I also want to thank the staff at Deloitte and the staff at Weinberg Center for putting together a phenomenal program. It's been awfully informative. And we at the Weinberg Center are very appreciative that, that our three uh, participants and our group has provided insights into an extremely important governance topic. We hope that you found the webcast to be of some value. P please feel free to share this video with your company, board, investors, and others who may find it of interest, hopefully lots. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and we appreciate you all being with us today. Thank you.